next up, we have Caitlin Greenidge. Caitlin's debut novel, We Love You, Charlie Freeman, was one of the New York Times Critics' Top 10 Books of 2016 and a finalist for the Center of Fiction First Novel Prize. She is a contributing writer for the New York Times, features director at Harper's Bazaar, and her writing has also appeared in Vogue, Glamour, Wall Street Journal, among others. Her second novel, Liberty, is just out in paperback. I happen to be reading that completely coincidentally, uh, and I am, it is utterly riveting. It's extraordinary. Uh, in her own words, about what type of writing she prefers, Caitlin says, no preference for genre, nonfiction and fiction are both asking questions and hopefully inviting a reader into an ongoing conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, Caitlin Greenidge. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Um, thank you for that amazing first story. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a trip that I took when I was 19, when I moved to Alaska. Um, but I'm going to start a little bit in a roundabout way and talk about sort of my earliest fears because they're connected. Um, so my earliest phobias were inherited and I learned to scream when my sisters did when they imagined a cartoon mascot looming outside the bedroom window or when they encountered a stray piece of garbage on the street. The first phobia I developed on my own was of fish. I remember very clearly watching the kids' science program 321 Contact with my grandmother one afternoon when I was in first grade, and the episode was all about the Arctic. The adolescent hosts of the show were on a submarine. They were at a polar research station. They were pulling an enormous pulsing brown sturgeon from the black icy waters that surrounded them, piercing her skin with hollow steel pipettes and extracting a mess of bulbous eggs to squirt and slide over an antiseptic steel tray. Or at least that's what I remember because it was at that moment of the show that I began screaming and screaming and screaming and then experienced a blackout. And when I came to, my grandmother was staring at me terrified. And I looked down at the living room carpet I was sitting on and imagined it was the same sandy pebble brown as the sturgeon skin. And I began to scream again, disgusted. I was paralyzed with fear. I couldn't move from the carpet and yet I desperately wanted to get away from this remainder, re, re, reminder of fish skin. And I screamed and cried, unable to move until my grandmother coaxed me onto an overnight, oversized pillow she set on the floor and left me there shaken. When my mother came home, what felt like hours later, my grandmother could only look at me in disbelief and horror. I've never seen anything like it, she said, shaking her head. I've never seen a child behave like that. So my one true fear was born fish and made worse by a story told to me in summer camp about a pregnant goldfish brought at the town fair whose distended belly exploded on the ride home. By the minnows my grandfather kept in an aquarium in the dining room that he flushed occasionally down the first floor toilet. A bathroom I could never use again because I imagined all those ghosted fish rising through the bowl to greet my bare ass whenever I sat on the seat. Fish tanks and restaurants were to be avoided. I became convinced that the sleazy tiki themed restaurant we used to sneak into after school was harboring a deep secret because its soft serve machine was too close to its wall length aquarium. I knew in my fish terror that those two were intimately connected. I knew it was an irrational fear and I took pride in that. It was not one that I was interested in conquering and it was more like a logic to the world that I could not understand why no one else could see it as well. Fish were disgusting insidious beings and just look at them in my body curl and revulsion. Um, when I was about 18, I left Boston where I was born and I went to New York City for college. While there, I worked three jobs in the school cafeteria in a daycare center with infants who seemed vaguely menacing and eerily cognizant of my depressive haze of the first year of college and at Ellis Island in the visitor service office. For Ellis Island, every Friday morning, I got up at 6 a.m. and took the one train from Washington Heights to the bottom of Manhattan. And then I got on the grimly quiet staff boat with the other Ellis Island workers, all of us avoiding eye contact that early in the morning. Instead, I watched the water. When I, at school, my skin began to grow scales, thick, ugly patches that looked like an animal's hide or a swordfish's back and fostered ugly, weeping sores. And I lost the ability to burp and sometimes swallow. I slept almost all the time. 
I was in my first year of college against my will, and I wanted to take a year off and work on an, or on an organic farm, instinctively knowing that I wasn't ready for school. But my mother balked. She was close. She was so close to having every girl of hers safely out of high school and maybe finally getting to take a breath. So she told me the farming plan was not a good one, that school was best. And I went and promptly fell into a depression so deep that my skin squirreled over with scruff and my mind dropped into a long, restless sleep from which I emerged only to go to class and work. I knew I had to escape this existence or sink further down to nothing. So my best friend from high school and I decided to move to Alaska. We moved there without a plan for the sole reason that we'd read on a scarcely populated website that Juno's public transportation system was voted the best in the United States. By whom, at what time, we didn't know, it didn't matter. Neither of us had driver's licenses, so we told ourselves we were doing research and being practical and picking this place. We wouldn't even need a car, but we could still live in a place like Alaska. We were not prepared for how small it was, it all was. Downtown Juneau is only a few blocks wide and it feels promising at first to shrink your world down to this single space. To get there, we took a ferry in September, we couldn't afford cabins, so we slept in blankets on the deck. And we passed the time talking about public radio hosts, Ira Glass and Scott Simon. This was the year 2000. And we were charmed and delighted when a fellow passenger overheard us and our love for listener supported broadcasting and told us that he worked at the city's public radio station and we should find him again when we landed. And with all the certainty of being 19, we agreed that this was a really good idea. And we didn't even realize how lucky we were when we discovered this man was telling the truth. It seemed like being there was maybe ordained. But we landed with a thud at the youth hostel while we looked for temporary jobs because uh, the public radio station wasn't hiring for a few months. Um, the ones promised at the station wouldn't come through until December. Um, and we couldn't find a place to live really at all or rent. And the hostel owners got increasingly annoyed with us. And for staying past the allotted deadline of two weeks, we were asked to work chores in the hostel. Mine was to clear out the abandoned food of other travelers. One day I opened one of the cupboards in the hostel's kitchen and found six blocks of Philadelphia cream cheese sitting on a shelf. I threw them away and headed back to my room at the hostel where I was ambushed by an angry Finnish woman a few hours later. You threw away my cheese, she said desperately. It was in its home where it belonged and you threw it away. This encounter and the strangeness of the place where we were living caused a panic attack, though I didn't know the name for it. But I couldn't swallow and I felt something rise up from my stomach and hover somewhere near the back of my throat for days. I walked and walked and walked the few blocks of Juno, and I tried to rem remind myself of how this was a promised land, how this was a place where things were supposed to be better. A few days later in the same hostel kitchen, a middle-aged woman traveling alone made a pan of overbaked salmon. She insisted that me and my friend taste it. My friend begged off because she was a vegan, so the woman turned to me expectant. She told me that it's fresh, that she's in Juno for the end of the salmon canning season. As she speaks, I look at the fish where it sits on the pan, the skin falling off, the meat pink, peak and pink and glistening. And she holds out a forkful to me and I force myself to take it because I'm worried about offending her. I force myself to swallow. In the next few weeks, we get an apartment at the base of the mountain, what seems to be another stroke of luck, except the apartment has a dead fish in the freezer. I know it's something bad as soon as I open the freezer door and see the bulk masked by a flurry of plastic bags. I reached out and I touched it and I felt the gap of a fish's mouth against my hand and I shuddered, squeezed my eyes shut and shoved the fish's body back into the dark and the cold and resolved never to use the freezer again, which I didn't for the next uh, eight months that I lived there. Um, eventually our jobs came through and we got hired at a program called Gavel to Gavel, which was essentially the Alaska State Legislator's version of C-SPAN. And the job that we got hired for was camera operator, which meant that we were pushing around a really heavy camera mounted on an equally heavy rolling tripod through the halls of the Alaska State House, following various really boring committee meetings and hearings around from room to room. I was used to the perceived invisibility of the big city, so it didn't occur to me that my friend and I would be of any interest to any of the people working in the State House, much less the legislators. But we were. The first few days of the job, we watched as members of the House and Senate stood to say the Pledge of Allegiance every day. And it didn't occur to either of us to join them. I hadn't said this Pledge of Allegiance since I was in third grade. 
I didn't feel inclined to start then. And my friend was technically a Canadian citizen, so it didn't occur to her to do it either. So for three days, we watched everybody else pledge allegiance to a flag. And then our producer asked me and my friend to come to his office. We were told that we've upset many of the state legislatures with our un-American stance. And we had to join the, we were told we had to join the Pledge of Allegiance the next time we were present for it. In a few days time, we're in the first legislative session of the day, the legislators rise and 10 of them crane their heads to watch where our hands go, if our mouths move, if we're saying anything during this moment. They smile triumphant when they catch us complying. And there it was again, that old sense of panic, the rise in my throat, a special feeling to know that tens of elected officials hold me in disdain. A few weeks later, one of the legislators, a kind one, one of the few native women serving in the Senate, invited me and my friend to her office. She said, it's a celebration. She said, the ban on whale hunting has been lifted for us. She showed us a tray with a number of thick pale squares on it. It's blubber, she smiles. She knows this is a test. We know this is a test. My friend again begs off because of veganism. The legislator turns to me, it's a delicacy. In that moment, I reach out for the piece of flesh on the tray. I pull it towards my mouth. I think of the animal it was a part of, twisting in some cold and silent ocean a thousand miles from here, sounding noises strange and terrible. And I think of the sea and all of its horrors that it contains, and I force myself to swallow. I left Alaska by the spring. When I got there, I'd have been convinced even before seeing the place that I would never go home again. I imagine meeting an Alaskan lumberjack and having babies of an Alaskan commune and generally divorcing myself from any of the confusion and anxiety of living in the lower 48. That's what Alaskans call the contiguous United States. And I like that. I reveled in the underlying sense of superiority in that phrase. But I left in the spring, fleeing back home to resume a conventional life. And my fear of fish came with me, but now it was part of a story. I was afraid of fish and temporarily moved to a state that worshiped them. Wasn't that funny? It would take a long time for me to understand what that story meant. Holding so tightly to your fear while also running toward it is supposed to be a sign of freedom, but not always. It's also a move of self-sabotage and sabotage is very seductive. It has to be to persuade you to work against your own best interest. There's something comforting in always knowing how a situation will end in discomfort and the sense of having failed. I think of myself sitting on that carpet that is pebbled like a fish's skin in the first form of fear the adrenaline doesn't feel good though. It's a surge that feels necessary to live in that moment. But there's the problem of being paralyzed, unwilling or unable to move while your whole body insists on motion. And that's the end.